Next up in fourth bat and cleanup, Jim Scarlata. He's the structural engineer in the Structures Policy and Innovation Bureau for major projects at New York State DOT. He will provide details about the joint elimination practices at New York State DOT. Both of these folks, actually Soundar and Jim, provided information for the case study that uh, GPI has been working on, and they have hundreds of bridges uh, that they've that they've done joint eliminations through Link Slabs. All right, so I'm going to start with a, a little background info with our experiences with bridge deck joints. Uh, given the harsh, harsh environment our bridges face here in New York State, many pre-stall, heavy usage of the icing agents. Uh, it was realized many decades ago that jet deck joints are detrimental to our bridges. Um, we have hundreds of examples where deck joints are to blame for significantly reducing a bridge's service life. Um, additionally, deck joints account for the majority of our maintenance activities, uh, such as joint headers, seal repairs, replacements, and reconstruction deck end. Um, also, joints are, are rather hazardous to the traveling public. With uh, all the snow we get and the snow cloud blades, we run them directly on the roadway surface, so joint headers and armoring angles are, are frequently dislodged, ripped out, and uh, scattered across the roadway. So now that deck joints are uh, firmly established as the number one enemy of our bridges, we are willing to go to great lengths to eliminate them on our structures as the life cycle cost savings. Um, and in addition to reducing impacts to traveling public um, are seen as significant benefits and in most cases, well worth the, the upfront cost of performing the joint removal. So in the following slides, I'm gonna go over some joint elimination practices that we've used here in New York State. I'm gonna highlight the method which we find to be the most efficient and explain why we prefer it and provide some uh, basic statistics on its usage. Before I get to that, I wanted to, to mention a few things that joint elimination involves really regardless of, of how it's accomplished. From a structural behavior standpoint, the joints have three functions. So they, they allow the superstructure to rotate about the horizontal axis. Uh, they accommodate the superstructure's thermal movements and they provide for discrete superstructure segments. When a joint is eliminated, you really need to consider how the rotations will be handled or resisted in some cases, how thermal movements will be accommodated, and what effects the, the now connected superstructure segments will have on the rest of the structure. Accommodating the thermal movements and managing the effects of connected superstructure segments in a manner that does not overload the existing substructures is what we have found to be the most challenging design aspect of joint elimination. Uh, however, in, in most cases, a strategically designed bearing configuration can prevent overloading of these components, eliminating the need to strengthen them. So what joint elimination typically boils down to for us, uh, in addition to removing the joint itself, is replacement of the bearings and installation of new expansion joints that accommodate larger movements off of the bridge. Okay, so now I will get into some of the practices we have here. First one is splicing of girders, shown on the top of the screen here. This method has probably been around the longest, but in recent years has fallen out of favor for a few reasons. Uh, one, once this detail is installed, it does perform well with typically only some minor deck cracking in the vicinity of the pier, very similar to what we see on our fully continuous bridges. The issues with this method, however, are the introduction of negative moments, which in some cases result in the need to strengthen the girders, add longitudinal reinforcement in deck, increasing deck removal, uh, additional diaphragm lines may be needed next to the pier to prevent buckling the bottom flange. Another undesirable aspect is the live load girder reactions will be increased by 25% due to the continuity potentially overloading the substructure and foundation and the girder webs. All this adds up to significant design and analysis effort, as well as construction costs. Uh, also, this technique um, becomes rather difficult if the girders are not the same depth. Now, regarding the construction, uh, girder splice fit-up has ended up being a major issue on numerous projects for us. Existing girders are not always perfectly lined up, plumb, or fabricated through tolerances that lend themselves to splicing. Uh, the spans also may shift over time. This results in a lot of onerous field measuring, fabricating the site tolerances, field drilling, bullpen abuse, et cetera. The next technique that we use, shown down on the bottom of the screen, is the installation of a full depth concrete end diaphragm. Uh, this method eliminates all the fit up issues uh, of splicing girders, which, which is a huge plus. And in many cases, repairs to address girder end deterioration are not necessary as the girders will now be encased in reinforced concrete. However, the major drawback for this method is that all the unfavorable aspects associated with introducing superstructure continuity occur here as well. Moving on to the next is on the top of the screen, conversion to integral abutments. We are huge fans of integral abutments here in New York State. So if it's feasible, converting to an existing abutment to an integral is highly preferred. 
Uh, the problem is the ability to do this is limited to only short span bridges where the superstructure's thermal movements become negligible. Our general rule of thumb is a maximum span around 40 feet. However, the foundation and abutment type can influence this uh, quote unquote rule. Now on the bottom of the screen, last but not least, is the link slabs. Link slabs are the latest, most advanced and effective weapon we have in our arsenal for fighting the war on joints. The, the main advantage of link slabs is that the superstructure simple span behavior is retained. So all the undesirable aspects of continuity, which I previously mentioned, are avoided. Link slabs require a less design effort, less deck removal, no superstructure or substructure strengthening, and they're easy to construct. Additionally, link slabs are very versatile. Uh, they can be used uh, on nearly any type of superstructure in any type of layout. Steel, concrete, narrow bridges, wide bridges, short spans, long spans, short bridges, long viaducts, straight, curved, corded, skewed, pretty much works everywhere. So essentially they, they are a direct replacement of a joint. This slide here is a little comparison of the, the two different types of link slabs that we currently use. On the left we have conventional and on the right we have UHBC. So conventional is essentially the, the bridge deck is extended on where the joint used to be and it's debonded from the girder. So it's comprised of our normal deck concrete, which is either HP or internal curing. It's a full depth slab. It matches the, the depth of the superstructure slab and it's rather long. So you had a hundred foot spans on each side. The, the length of the link slab is almost nearly 20 feet long. Where on the other hand, uh, UHPC is much, much shorter in the neighborhood of two or three feet. This is very advantageous in areas with high traffic volumes because work can be done um, you know, at night offline and it can be spanned over with road plates during the day. Uh, because the conventional link slab is a full depth, it, it's a much higher rotational restraint compared to the UHPC link slab, which is only four inches deep. The conventional link slab attracts a lot more moments, resulting in more re longitudinal reinforcement needed to resist these moments, where on the other hand, UHPC, you know, it's much thinner, it's more flexible, it only requires a nominal longitudinal reinforcement. We consider conventional link slabs to, to have an average durability, very similar to the deck over a pier of a continuous uh, superstructure. And then on the other hand, UHPC is very durable, it's resistant to cracking and has a very, very low permeability rates for uh, moisture and chlorides. For conventional, we, we typically use these when we're doing a full deck replacement, being the fact that it's much longer than UHPC, and we're already replacing the entire deck, that the length of it is really inconsequential. But UHPC, we, we tend to use that more when we're just eliminating joints. The deck's in good shape due to the much smaller length that the work area is just confined to around the pier. Uh, making things a lot easier to you know, quickly get that work done. We require UHPC joints between our precast elements. So when we're doing precast decks, uh, we already have the material on site. So we use that for the link slab as well. And that makes precast panel details a lot simpler as well. Here is a bar chart of our link slab usage with the running total number of link slabs let each year. The number of UHPC is in blue, conventional in orange. Um, our first link slab was let in 2012, constructed in 2013. Over the next couple of years, uh, we, we did a few more. Then once we were able to evaluate their performance, which is an excellent, by the way, and further developed analysis methods and details, uh, the usage has really taken off. We currently have over 100 link slabs built with another 100 plus being constructed over the next year or two. Um, I should also mention really quick that we don't have the greatest system in place for, for tracking link slabs yet in the works. I'm certain we have link slabs out there that are not really accounted for here. In conclusion, uh, link slabs are New York State DOT's preferred method for eliminating deck joints and existing bridges. They are economical because of the reduction in design time, the small amount of structure removal and reconstruction required. Uh, they also avoid undesirable negative moments and higher beam reactions. As, the, as I mentioned before, the simple span behavior is retained. And they also offer a long and maintenance free service life. Uh, we also prefer links to that because they're versatile. These can be used on pretty much any superstructure type and configuration. That uh, wraps up my presentation today. Thank you for your attention. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.